Hi, everybody. Okay, let's get settled in. We'll do that opening meditation. You can close your eyes for this one. Take a deep breath in through the nose. Breathe out through the mouth. Let the breath fall naturally. We can feel that there is a potential within us. We can also feel that this potential wants to be expressed. We can see that everyone is hurting in some way. And that pain is making them do crazy things. That pain arises because of causes and conditions and those causes and conditions can be changed. New thoughts, words, and actions can be initiated or taken up that are wise, skillful, and nobly worthy of an awakened being. This will then lead to a life of freedom and true authentic happiness, a life that expresses that potential that we can feel within us. I want you to imagine, imagine that world of potential now. Imagine that life of freedom. Imagine a world where everyone is free and truly happy. What does that world look like? What does that world feel like? And how would you think, speak, and act in that world? To help us now actualize that potential, we call out to the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Masters, and Teachers of the Dharma of the three times in the ten directions, please consider us with kindness and understanding and grant us your blessings that these aspirations may be accomplished quickly. May it be that we all swiftly achieve enlightenment for the sake of all beings. Take a deep breath in through the nose. Breathe out through your mouth. And open your eyes. So after long last, we come to that final petal, final limb, final stage, but it's not really a stage, of the path, the Eightfold Path, uh, right Samadhi. So Samadhi, a lot of times they translate Samadhi as concentration, and this misses the mark. So, some other translations, possibilities of the word samadhi. To settle, to put at ease, union, concentration of thoughts, profound meditation, to be in agreement, to not be at odds with, to bring together, to bring into harmony, absorption, sanctuary, attention, <coughs> joining, Wholeness, equanimity, calmness, contentment, unification, one-pointedness, steadiness of mind, settled mind, concentrated mind, undistracted. All right. All right. These are all various ways that this word can get translated. All right. So sometimes it's best for, the, for samadhi to not translate it. But you need to know that like when you hear samadhi, all of that potential is in it. Uh, the Buddha gave a really, really good example of samadhi. Suppose that a wild deer is living in a glen within the wilderness. Carefree it walks, carefree it stands, carefree it sits, and carefree it lies down. Why is that? Because it has gone beyond the hunter's range. You feel that ease? Right? Imagine that deer. Just that ease. Right? That's somebody. Right? That ease, that grace, that absorption in that moment, carefree where a single blade of grass becomes the most beautiful and mysterious thing in the universe. Right? No rushing here and there, no past, no future. 
no thought, no concern. That feeling. That. When you hear samadhi, think of that. For us, the Buddha said, in the same way, a person quite withdrawn from sensual pleasures, i.e. living a simplistic life, withdrawn from unskillful qualities, that's like the precepts, wholesome, unwholesome, right? Enters and remains in the first jhana, the meditative state. And when we're in that state, naturally, rapture and pleasure, born from that withdrawal, that ease of relief, and then accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. Right? Directed thought is that, that insight. Right? Samadhi, that ease, that stability, is necessary, is the foundation, the platform for your insights to happen. Right? That first part. So it's interesting that the Buddha says that, right? One, that this samadhi is naturally inherent within you. To help you discover that, right, it's good to live simplistically. Right? Not to be caught up in cravings. Right? Remember we talked back to number one. Right? Live a life that's skillful. That you're showing up in the world and your thoughts, words, and actions are harmonious, right? wholesome. These are two qualities that help reveal samadhi. Ah, interesting, right? Samadhi gets revealed. Right? Once more and more samadhi gets revealed because you're not a jerk <laughs> anymore, right? You're not chasing after the next thing. This natural ease gets revealed to you. Right? You don't have to worry about that somebody's going to try to get you because there's no reason for somebody to try to get you because you're a friend to all. Right? Yeah. Sometimes, as well, it's presented that um, there's five hindrances that are covering up this innate ease. Craving. Right, okay. We sort of can see that now, right? Ill will. Right? And ill will can fall under lots of different categories. Judgments, criticisms, gossip. Right? And then it keeps going to the other extremes, right? Until it's like acted out. Right? Even craving and ill will could be liking and disliking, right? In the Zen tradition, they talk about that. Like, notice when your mind is getting caught. I want, I don't want. I like, I don't like, right? Boom. Right? Greed, aversion, right? Sloth, laziness, covers it up. These two are usually presented together. Restlessness and remorse covers it up. Right. Worry and doubt covers it up. And these are all states of mind that drag you away, that hook you. Right? And more and more we do like every Every, since we've started to meet, we meditate each time to help us build that stability so that we can see when we get hooked, when we get dragged, pulled away by one of these hindrances. Right? By one of these hindrances. So such that, right, these things, somebody is there. There, we're covering it up. There's a screen called craving, ill will. So the, the practice is to notice. I'm getting hooked. Wanting, yearning, craving, 
desiring and getting hooked with judgments to notice. The somatic state means that we are in a state of equanimity and groundedness. There's peace, tranquility, and stabilization of mind, and this state is undisturbed by externals. Our scattered and tattered state is unified, brought back together, placed evenly upon the present moment and un in an unwavering fashion. The mind-heart state is beyond extremes, and because the mind is clear and stable, insight is able to be revealed spontaneously. Picture a calm lake, that's samadhi. The wisdom of right view can be seen as like the full moon reflecting on that lake. And you can only see the beauty of the moon when the lake is still. When it's wavy, you can't see the beauty of the, of the moon. Through our continual efforts, our distracted and scattered and scarred state of mind is healed and comes to rest in a new state of tranquility and bliss. But this isn't the only thing that happens. We also become cloaked in a new state of being, one that permeates and penetrates every fiber, every cell, every thought, word, and action of our lives. Yeah. So it's there. Right? It's there in these things. We're shrouding it, covering it on top of it. Mm -hmm. so. That's Mahdi, mm -hmm. right? So this is sort of like a twofer class, right? <laughs> okay, because what we're going to talk about next is called the Four Noble Truths and their tasks. A lot of times the Four Noble Truths are just like, most people don't teach the Four Noble Truths because it's not sexy, there's no empowerment, no secret mantras, no little fist, fist bumps or anything like this that's happening, right? But it's needed, right? And you've seen it in your lives, like looking at the world a little bit differently and how it's opened up you. How you talk, how you walk, how you respond to the world around you, to the people in it, to yourself, <laughs> right? So, a way to frame it would be, so the tasks of the first noble truth, right? There is dukkha, suffering. So the task is to understand that, to see it in yourself, in the world around us. There are causes of dukkha, noble truth too. The second task is to let go, to release, those unskillful, unwholesome states of mind, thoughts, words, <coughs> deeds, more and more. Just continue to let go. Let go. Right? And as we are able to let go, then these wholesome thoughts, words, and deeds naturally arise. As well, we can work at it. Right? We can work at it. Third noble truth, there is an end to suffering, right? So in your day, those moments of peace, the moments of joy, those moments of compassion, ease, grace, wonder, right? Savor those moments, right? <coughs> Savor them, right? Because there's so many times where you think that it's not possible. The evidence is proving otherwise. Because we live in a society that, right, if somebody is at ease, joyful, compassionate, there is something different, wrong about them. Person, person that doesn't want to smoke out the competition, right? They're seen as weak. Right? It's a very, <laughs> very different world out there, right? So, those times when you're happy for no apparent reason. Right? Those times when your heart breaks open, 
because of compassion and that's in there. It's latent in there. Right? Sit with those things. Save them. Know that it's possible to be free. Fourth Noble Truth, there is a path that leads to the end of suffering, the Eightfold Path. And that fourth task is to go for it, to do it, right? Every day, show up in your life and see how it unfolds, right? See how it unfolds. A path is a little bit of a misnomer. Maybe it'd be better like the path within, right? Right? But the fourth task is to go for it, to practice the path, to put into practice what you've heard, what we've talked about, what you've experienced. Right? Right? So there's the Four Noble Truths and their task. Because sometimes the Four Noble Truths are framed as uh, beliefs. No. There's nothing to believe here. There is no belief necessary. It's like, go look. Look at your own life. Look at your own heart. Look at the words that you're using. Look at the actions that you think. And then once you look, then come back. Let's talk. Let's have tea. <laughs> Let's meditate. Right? Yeah. To put it into practice. It's not going to be in the next book. Right? Your life is your Dharma temple. Your life. Driving that car. How many people did you yell at today while you're driving that car? <laughs> right? How much frustration did you have at that red light? Right? With that person going a little bit too slow. Car is a beautiful place to reveal yourself. You can see that. It's amazing. It's amazing. You have to be curious about yourself in a compassionate and a gentle way. Right? We have not been shown that there is this huge latent potential. We have been shown otherwise, told otherwise. Now we have a glimpse, right? We get to see that there's a different way that we can show up in our own lives, for the people that show up in our lives, and for life itself. Okay. Okay, bye everybody.